Welcome back, Welcome back on Fans, episode 191 or two, two maybe, of the podcast. And today is a legendary guest, uh, a guy who has had a running joke about him in the program for a while amongst some of his friends, uh, myself included, that you just simply never feel bad for this guy, no matter what he may uh, potentially complain about during that. Not a big complainer, but if he comes with a complaint, you just never feel bad for this guy because the guy... Uh, some would say he, he has it made taller than the fucking skyscraper, stronger than the goddamn ox, bowed as fast as Usain Bolt. I mean, just an absolute playmaker, now world champ, thought he was a defensive end. Turns out he's an outside linebacker. Uh, what up champ, Anthony Nelson. Welcome to the podcast. What's up fellas, man. It's good to be on. That's a that's a heck of an intro. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you're overhyping me, but world champ, that feels nice. And I, I like hearing that next to my name. I bet you do, dude. <laughs> uh, that's literally, that's the goal, dude. So you're a kid from Des Moines. Granted, you're, you're a kid who had a little more skills than everybody else and was expected to go a little farther. But you're the same kid from the Des Moines area that Kluver was. Kluver thought he was going to the NFL, just like you were probably dreaming of the NFL back in the day. And look, you know, one of these Des Moines kids actually got the job done. <laughs> uh, man, don't let Kluver, don't let him talk to you like that, man. You're doing a lot of, a lot of great things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. I'm glad. <laughs> you know what, Anthony? I'll take it. I'll take it because I'm not going to get any further with the other two on this podcast uh, on, on the nice comments. I, I do want to say, Anthony, thank you. Uh, I am now a resident of Waukee, the key to good living. And you have officially brought home the Super Bowl championship to Waukee, Iowa. So that is, that is what I want to want to thank you for. Uh, absolutely have no claim to that, but I'm going to claim it. Um, how does that feel? Like when I say that, even though it's a joke, but it's also reality, how does that feel? I mean, I feel like it just makes me smile. I don't know how I feel like you say it like a joke and I say it like a joke too, but the, I mean, it is crazy. Like that it, that, you know, from Waukee just, and then, you know, a couple of years, you know, at Iowa and then a couple of years in the NFL and we're world champs and feels good. I'm glad we, we can share in this together as a resident of Waukee. I hope everybody from Waukee can share in it too, but me, me and Kluver got one world championship. Uh, the rest of the guys on the podcast got, well, none so far. So That is that. absolutely true. <laughs> I'll and I'll that. tell you what, if Muscatine ever gets a world champ, it might be coming from Joe Wieskamp, which would be legendary because it's another Hawk bringing another world championship to the podcast. That would be cool. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. He's a baller. He's a baller. He's a savage. Uh, Anthony, how – I have to imagine that a bunch of people have reached out. I mean, I'm sure the phone was just blown up over the last couple of weeks. Uh, what is it like to talk to people from back home and represent, you know, Waukee high school and just where you came from? And like, is, is that, is that a real surreal thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, everybody was reaching out, but, I mean, just being able to like talk, like you said, from all those people back in Waukee and, and uh, you know, from my earlier days, middle school, high school, um, it's been really cool to, to see how much they have been following me and, and then just to be able to share in that experience with them. Um, just knowing that like, you know, I mean, there's a lot of coaches in middle school and high school that, that you know, they contribute a lot to where I'm at now, um, you know, and I don't get as much glory as, as the coaches later in my career, but like just as important. So it's pretty, it's pretty sweet to, to be able to share that memory. Like, like you joked about earlier, but, but in like all seriousness to be able to share that, uh, sharing that joy and, and sharing that celebration with, uh, all the people I've, I've been able to interact with and, and, and uh, you know, come in my contact when I was at Waukee. So I did some research. I went back, read a couple articles on you and <laughs> the, the one thing that stuck out to me was, was the fact that, and I, and you can talk about this cause it's, it's really interesting. You almost quit football in sophomore year of high school. Yeah. Talk about yep. that. 
what was the mindset going on there? I mean, that is, like I said, you know, there's, there's people that convinced me to go out for football that I'm now, I'm forever indebted to. Um, That's after, eternal. But, I mean, basically, and, yeah. basically, I was a tall athletic guy and I was going to be a basketball player. You, you were way go good at basketball. NBA. Yeah. You were way good at basketball too. And uh, I just, I don't know. I just, I had a lot more interest at that point when I was a freshman and sophomore in basketball and football. I was playing quarterback until I was a freshman and really wasn't enjoying that as much. Had been hurt the whole year, the whole freshman year too. So I, I just, I, I really, I was, I always wanted to make it far and I want to be like, you know, playing college and then play professionally. And I just thought like at that time I was young, I didn't really know, but I just, I thought basketball was the move. And clearly I was wrong. So <laughs> well, maybe not though. <laughs> but, because like, um, do you not think you could have gone and got 20 for the Hawks every night? Cause you probably could have. I mean, I don't know about 20 cause that's, that's, that's putting me in the, the weed camp category, but I think I definitely could have contributed some solid numbers. Well, you decided as a junior that you were going to play football and now you're a world champ. So are we really shooting too much over? Central? <laughs> that is true. That is true. I guess, uh, I guess we never know. We never know. I always wanted to play. Uh, I played with some of the younger guys uh, in AAU, and I, I always thought I could have played. But, you know, I don't think uh, Coach France would have been too happy if I was doing the, doing the double duty. The double sport athlete. That would have been it, – it's so hard to do with football. It's, like, almost impossible. The, so when you made that switch, in the article, I believe it was something like uh, – you you would like quit for a, a couple weeks or whatever and then you started missing it and like missing your friends and you talked to your dad and your dad played at Iowa right from 88 yep. to 92 or something like that yeah and he was like why don't you try defense uh like you said you had been playing quarterback and so you went over to the defensive side of the ball and just you absolutely started to wreck uh i believe we played you guys my senior year your sophomore year and, or, so would you have played varsity during that sophomore season? Okay, no, so, I didn't play any varsity until I was a junior. Okay, I didn't think so because I remember the the years after that because my brother was still playing. Um, yeah, I remember you just absolutely demolishing people. But I was like, where did this kid come from? Like, we just played walk. Like, why wasn't he playing last season? So you you went over to the defensive side of the ball and. From that point on, was the was the goal and kind of the dream like okay, I'm I'm intentionally trying to to make the most out of football and go D one and 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 be big time. Yeah, I mean, it didn't. I don't think it happened like that that quick for me. But like you said, I I sat out a couple of years when I was a so or a couple of weeks when I was a sophomore. Um, but basically pulled the ultimate vet move unintentionally and basically missed training camp. So, <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> and then, uh, but then, uh, one of my, one of my, uh, RP teachers, Mr. Highland, who's a football coach. He, uh, he, I mean, there's a, a bunch of football coaches that were like, yeah, maybe you should just try it, stay with it, whatever. And he was the one that like finally convinced me to do it. And he's like, yeah, we'll let you join blah, 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 whatever. And so then I went down to our head coach's office and was like, hey, I, I want to play. But, you know, I know I missed all camp. What I, um, so, like, I had to sit out a couple of games just to, mm -hmm. like, just for missing camp. But, yeah, I ended up playing the sophomore season on defense and then backing up at quarterback. And then the next year I just was just all defensive end. And uh, But I would say that transition, I really still thought I was going to play basketball. It was more like I just kind of, like, liked football. And I yeah. was like, all my friends are doing it. I mean, I was just like, you know. A 15 year old kid, I was like, ah, all my friends are doing it and I'm doing nothing and it kind of sucks. I was just in the gym shooting like a couple hundred shots and I was like, ah, this is going to get boring real quick. So, got to do something else. Yeah. So I Hitting up, people then, is a lot better than taking jumpers. Yeah. And then after my junior year, and even through my junior year, I didn't even like going into the season, I really didn't know if I was going to start or whatever. And then I played and I played well, but I didn't really like know how well. And then I got like interest after that. And then and then that time it was 50 50, but then I got offers from, or I got offered from Iowa state and, and I was like, all right, like that was my first like uh, power five offer. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I'm probably going to be football. I'm not, I'm not getting offers like that in basketball. So. Right. That's kind of what switched it over. Like, okay, I'm going the football route. Yeah. Now talk about the Iowa state. I, I took some questions from Twitter uh, just for a little extra content. We'll get to some of those. One of them was, 
Um, did you always want to play for the Hawks when you like, would you have always preferred the Hawkeyes basketball or football before you could really figure it out? And then were you like, were you upset that Iowa state offered first and you kind of went that route before the Hawks came calling? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So I always wanted to play for Iowa. Like you said, my dad played for Iowa Mm -hmm. and like every once in a while I'm like ESPN classic or ESPN U like, I'd see one of his games and then he had some tapes in the basement, you know, like uh, VHS, whatever's oh, yeah. in the basement. And so we'd always watch those every once in a while, but like, yeah, I wanted to be like him. I mean, he played college football. I thought like that was like the coolest thing ever growing up. And then, um, so I did want to play for the Hawkeyes, but then, yeah, like as I got, as I played my junior season, I got interest um, and I went to camp <laughs> and you guys will appreciate this. Um, I went to Iowa's football camp first. I think it was back to back, like Saturday and Sunday or Friday yep. and Saturday. Mm-hmm. So I went to Iowa's first and the D, D line, and I'm way underweight. You guys know that from when yep. I came in. I was maybe two, when I'm at this camp, I'm probably like 200 pounds. Like I didn't, when I got to Iowa, I was like 210. And that was after like intentionally like trying to bulk up before mm-hmm. stepping on campus. So, but I went to Iowa's camp and we just did challenge drill for. Okay. 15, 20 minutes straight. Oh, <laughs> I mean, right. just battering ram into, and they're like, and they have a lot of, they get a lot of good offensive linemen. It's like O line you, right? So there, there's like kids that are 300 pounds or, you know, 275. And I just, I mean, I'm doing all right, but I'm just like, this is, this is not for me. I was <laughs> crashing my head into just other people for 20 minutes straight. Did no, and we didn't do that many like athletic drills, like the running, the cutting, stuff like that. So, I mean, I thought I did decent, but like, I was like, you know, I, I don't think they really loved me. And then I uh, didn't yeah. get an offer or anything. Like I didn't talk to any coaches really after. And uh, I mean, Coach Morgan, who was, you know, the Iowa recruiter, he, he like talked to me briefly. It was like, all right, nice to see you. Like, good job. But like, you know, I was like, oh, cool. And then uh, I just ran my head against somebody for 20 minutes and, just got a good pat on the back and uh, nothing really else. I was looking for like maybe something even like, Hey, I can see you walking on or whatever, but. Right. right. Um, but then, yeah, the next day I went to Iowa state camp and it was like polar opposite. Like it was all athletic drills. Um, and you crushed. Basically like ran up. Yeah. Ran like a mini combine did. We did barely any run blocking. It was all one-on-one pass rush. And I, <laughs> yeah, and I did really well. And like, I ran like, a, like a really fast, like, short shuttle even though I never practiced it before like it was just like and it was basically tailor-made for me and then I got offered like that day at Iowa State and how, uh I was yeah, definitely how, a little... how soon between the offers did Iowa come calling after that it was not so I was I mean I was a, I was a little child but I was a little bitter that I would like they didn't get any real interest or like anything and and I I knew like just for my performance based on the the skills and the the this that I had at that time it was like I didn't really do as great at Iowa's camp just because sure it was all just banging but yeah I was I probably like four days after I committed Iowa State because I was like I want to go to I, I wanted to stay close so I want to go to Iowa, or Iowa State and I was like I I mean I have no problem going to the Big 12 and playing against all these power five schools and and uh I think Iowa so that was probably in July that was before my senior year and I don't think Iowa came calling until December. So it was like it's, after my senior season. It's like a Josie Jewell situation snagged him at the last, the last minute. Yep. Um, yep. You arrived at I, in, in Iowa City in the class that the, some of the older classes like to call. Uh, um, you, you, you guys were kind of the class, that 2015 class that had shit sweet, right? You walked in to a 2015 12-0 regular season everything's you know spinning the gears are turning perfectly and y'all really didn't understand in that first season like it ain't this it ain't this easy like this ain't dude out. it was a new complex right yeah yep so new complex great food 12 and 0 victory lobster every sunday i mean they had it sweet they, it's that shit was sweet you guys man. Got new dorms that year too i think new dorms yeah, brand new dorms, new brand first year in the facility, uh, twelve and L Big Ten Championship. I was like, man, this is pretty easy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Everybody in that class had just a little bit of entitlement. Like, 
man, I don't understand what everyone's so bent out of shape. Like this shit is not hard. Yeah. Um, and obviously you, you, over your four years, you came to understand it really wasn't like that. Uh, what was your first impression? The first, you know, your first year on campus during that season, what was it like for you being a part of that class? Um, I mean, we, uh, it, it was, it, it's just like a shock for, I feel like for anybody just from talking to people, but like, I mean, just going to, from high school to college and going to Iowa, it was pretty, just like shock. I feel like at first you're kind of just head spinning, even though it was nice uh, with the facilities and we got the, the meals and all that uh, at the new facility, which was nice. And, uh, but I, I feel like just like the, the first memory I have, and I won't, I won't say his name, but he didn't last in the program long, but like he came late and um, to his first workout it was like 5:45, and he w- didn't like change his socks to like the white socks the team issued. It was like he was wearing black socks, mm-hmm. and like all the strength coaches just like ripped into him, whatever, sent him back. And I, I was looking at 9:30, so he had like come back to the dorm, told me the story before, like I'm even leaving to go to the to go on my first workout. So I just really, like, remember that as like a real tempo setter for like <laughs> right. not being late and, and uh, how like strict and like real it was, like it was a different level in high school. Yeah. But uh, I, I mean, I just remember like the old, like the older guys really commanded the the room in every room. Like we had Drew out in our room and I remember just like, um, like the way that he, enforced everything and, and really like set the standard and then I saw that like going out throughout the locker room and then with every position um on how like really it was like a strong culture and everybody kind of had a, a fall in line um and it was just going to be a lot of hard work but the workouts were a lot harder too I remember like the first day we did prowlers and every like all but like two guys in our 20 some person class are just throwing up for good 20 minutes after workout. So love those that. are the kind of things that stuck out to me. You, uh, the, so you know, the workouts were hard through that first year. I'm sure we get to the off season and I think you came in at like two, they had you at like two ten that first year or whatever. Right. And that was you, like you said, you had tried to bulk up on your own just to get there. And so we get into conditioning and you know, your, your boy wasn't exactly good at running, okay? And I'm in the semis group. You're supposed – you're in the D-line group or the line group, so you have a whole extra second to make times. And Coach Doyle very quickly takes you from the line group to the semi group. I remember running right next to you and getting absolutely dusted, okay, making me look like a real asshole. And then – you're killing the semis so bad that one day he takes like Bo, Josie, and you and puts you with the skills. And I was happy because I no longer had to run next to you and look like a dumbass. But what did you think about that first off season? And when you ran those, were you laughing at everybody else? Because it looked that easy. <laughs> I, you know that's funny that you say that because like I have a completely like, completely other side I'm just like the freshman hasn't done anything like I could already tell it was like a very like earn your stripes culture so I remember telling like all my family and, and my uh, girlfriend at the time um, and now she's on fiance but she I was like okay, I, so everybody when we do conditioning out uh, everybody takes their shirts off oh yeah everybody takes their shirts off and I remember telling him, I was like, I can't take my shirt off. Like, I'm way too skinny to take my shirt off. <laughs> so, like, I remember being, like, fast, but I was kind of like, I'm cheating. Like, I'm running. These I'm guys che- are, like, carrying, I'm like, cheating. 40. <laughs> These said, guys are carrying. He said, I'm like- cheating. Oh, my God, <laughs> Antoine. That is, that is the exact opposite that I felt when I was a freshman. I felt like everybody else was cheating or like that. I was born with one leg when I first started running and your, your reaction was I'm cheating. Oh my. Well, I felt God. like everybody else was running around with like 40 pounds on their back and I'm running around as light as a feather, like a light, light as light, as light as like some DBs, like safeties and receivers. And so, your stride length is crazy. Yeah. So, but yeah, I remember telling them like, I, I'm like, I was doing like running fast, but I was like, I'm not, 
like everybody else takes their shirt off it's so hot i want to take it off but like i'm like i'm not taking it off until i get to like at least 250 i'm like way too skinny like you can still see my ribs like this is not like i'm not taking my shirt off until i get to, dude like, you had to wait 40 pounds to take your shirt off <laughs> How well, did I'll that... tell you what, bud. It didn't. It didn't take. Uh, it didn't take too long. It was about. That that's, was about eight fair. months. It was, it was about eight. one song. You you went from so you were, god damn. You you put on weight that quick. Talk about that and and putting on weight and and what kind of journey that was like. Yeah, that was a. Uh, that was interesting. That was that was probably the most like miserable time at Iowa. Was like that first year. I was just like eating constantly. I felt awful constantly. What were some of the tactics of you longer. used? What? What were some of the tactics you use, like f- specific foods that you would have every day, or stuff that like you, you stuff that made it easier for you to put on that weight? Do you remember anything specific that you, every day you're just like, oh my god, I have to eat this again? Yeah, I basically, I would say, I mean, I would just say my eating schedule was insanity. That I, uh, I uh, probably put on like thirty to forty pounds in that like first like eight to ten months, and I would be like eat facility or I would go in the morning and eat facility breakfast, like before practice, practice, go eat, go uh, like hurry and get lunch at the, um, or at the refueling station and then eat that, grab lunch at like uh, Hillcrest. And then I'd come back, I'd eat dinner at the facility and then I'd grab like a second dinner at um, Hillcrest, like right before it closes. You were and eating, then I would you eat were eating like, two lunches and two dinners basically. Yeah. And then I would eat like, uh, like a fair life or two and some Greek yogurt at, before bed and then wake up in the middle of the night and like drink a shake. And then oh, oh, it was bad. <laughs> it was bad. Damn it. Also a lot of trips to Poncheros with some queso, two, oh, yeah. two, burritos, yeah. two burritos each pop. Hey, Kevin, what's the, what's the, Kevin, tell them. What, what, what's the rule? One burrito is a snack, two is a meal. <laughs> I love that rule. Yes. One's yeah, a snack, two is a meal. Way in. Like and, freeway at night, I'd go get a couple of burritos and and uh, add on the pounds. So you have Poncher- Poncheros to thank for your size. Built by Poncheros, baby. Now that you're a Super Bowl champion, I feel like you should be reaching. I mean, you they need should to get definitely... a Poncheros sponsorship. Yeah, you got to get the sponsorship, man. Um, I know. I got, no I'm gonna have to, to get you, my agent Poncheros. on that. Yeah, you, you got to talk to your agent. We'll, yeah, we can yeah, probably no set that agents. up. You guys, you guys, you guys probably set it up. We can you set that up, no, dude. We're gonna set it up through you. You're gonna you're gonna get the Ponchero sponsorship, and it's gonna be retroactive to us because we gave you the idea. Right. And Ponchero's has to hand us down a couple gift cards or something. Yeah. Well, yeah, I live in Florida now, so, so talk to the- it's a long trip to go get some Ponchero's. You guys can just pick it up for me and, and eat it for me right. too while you're at it. We'll take it. We'll definitely take that. Um. So you redshirt that first year. Shit was sweet, right? We talked about it. Then you uh you get on the field in year two, right? Your size is finally. Um, I assume somewhere in that 2016 off season, you started to feel like physically, not only could you take your shirt off, but you could actually compete with these guys, right? Your speed and your quickness was obviously a, a large factor in you doing well on the edge, but you started to bring the size with it too. Was that, was that kind of how it worked? You felt like you started to belong a little bit? Yeah. Um, that's exactly how it felt. I mean, first camp, I was just getting, tossed around by everybody like and we do you know drake knows this we do blocks nine on every day two run periods during team all those run periods i was just getting absolutely abused i like that's <laughs> i was just getting thrown around and i was like i don't i don't on first camp i was like i don't even know why i'm here like i'm just getting absolutely <laughs> just thrown around i can't like this isn't a speed game at all like i'm just getting absolutely abused but yeah, then the second, the second, like, welcome to the party, ball. though. I mean, welcome to the party of the, the <laughs> of the abuse. Like, I feel like everyone's been abused at, at some point in that fashion. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. Kevin, he has PTSD. He didn't even remember his first few camps. He, uh, my, my first camp was horrible, but you know, that kind of re- story reminds me of when uh, I literally moved down to Leo my first day at Leo because everyone else is hurt and I got to go against George Kittle during blocks and. I'm literally just getting driven into the ground five yards out of bounds. And it's like, all right, well, do it again because the second team's coming up with another three reps. There's nobody else behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Antoine, do you remember any specific guys that just absolutely manhandled you and you were like ready to quit? <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. I mean, I remember going because at, at 
that first year, George was the second tight end, I think. Yeah. If I'm correct. Yep. So, and I was, I was like, sometimes I was going against him and he absolutely, like my first year to like my second and third year when I went against him was completely different. But like, I mean, the first year I was just like, how is he so fast and strong? And then, uh, I think some people are still trying to figure that out. <laughs> I'm, that makes me feel a little better, but I remember, um, yeah, I remember like Dalton Ferguson, we went up against each other a lot and he was just like the, I mean, he was just like moving me in the run game. And I was just like, Pete, Pete Carr put me on my back once or twice. Allegedly. And I was like, man, maybe this, maybe this isn't for me because I got Pete out here just throwing me on my back and block drill. It's not, it's not a good start for the boys. <laughs> you started to figure it out though, right? Like, I mean, in that first year that you played, I think you had a couple sacks, right? You had like four sacks. Yeah. Um, that was all that stuff. Like just absolutely getting tossed around the first camp. And then by the time that next spring ball rolled around, I was bigger and actually like realized that I just needed a little bit of weight mm -hmm. and I would be, I would be able to do it. But yeah, I mean, in that second camp, I figured out and I was going and, and at that point I was going and rotating in with Parker and Matt yeah. um, and with the ones and I was going against like Ike and Boone every day and then George again on tight end. And, and that second camp was a lot different than the first camp uh, yeah. um, and the black drill and stuff like that. So speaking of Ike, he always said that um, you were actually the toughest guy to block just because you had the most insanely long arms of everyone else on the D line. So I, I don't know. I just want to. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I try to use long arms when I can. He's just like, yeah, I got fucking long arms. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say. Uh, so, oh God, it would be great to have those levers. Um, do you feel like you still ever have the advantage when you play now, even in the league, right? Like, you, I mean, there's freaky guys in the league, but even on that level, you're six seven. What are you six seven, six eight almost? Yeah, six and, seven. And do you ever feel like is there still ever that like, oh, I'm cheating feeling? Like I'm lighter than these guys, I'm longer than these guys, or is it does it feel like more work now now that you're at the top level? Well, yeah, it feels like more work if and uh I mean it's just like there's everybody's good, which I mean obviously it's NFL, everybody's good, but like everybody's good. Like even the starters down and a backup comes in, it's not like you're getting the backup, you know, at Illinois, you know, you're getting like a guy that was really good in college. Like he's getting paid too. And like, he's, I mean, there's no bad guys out there. So that's one, that's one thing that's different. And, but yeah, I mean, it's it definitely, you feel like you get smaller advantages, but it's, it's not, um, it's not as lopsided. Yeah. Shout out to the backup at Illinois though. Cause he still started Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> true probably um you can talk about your career uh you know so you, you got in on that rotation like you said with uh parker and matt um we had i mean for a while there we had the nelson towers right it was kind of cool and now he has a crazy story that we need and to it was you. incredible on third and short because they blocked so many passes yeah you guys right. were just extra dbs because they would try and throw short outs and short slants and mm, can't do it and so I would love to hear about like some of your favorite memories playing or what, you know, what you, what you believe Iowa did for you as a, as an athlete and even school wise, you were able to graduate in three and a half years and you end up deciding to leave early, which would have loved to have you in the black and gold for another year. Would have loved it. But were we mad at you at the podcast? No, because no. you got your cash. You got to go but... get the bag, right? Were we disappointed as now diehard Hawk fans? A mm, little bit. A little bit. And so I want you to talk about that decision. If there was any like real turmoil, how back and forth was that? And what all went into, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to go try and make this thing work. Yeah. I mean, like I had a lot of good moments at Iowa and a lot of them were like with you guys in those years when we played like Ohio state and Michigan Mm -hmm. even um Penn State then uh with the one we lost I mean that one hurts the most but like it is one of the, probably the most memorable game um ever playing I mean the, the atmosphere in Kinnick that night was insane unmatched but uh as far as like leaving I uh I did go back and forth on it a lot um like I, I 
I kind of guessed I was going to get like in the third or fourth round. And I was just kind of like, that's good. I can come back and do, you know, try and improve it or whatever. But I really just, I mean, more so I just like, I was like, oh, I can do it. Like, just like kind of the competitor side of it was like, I can do it. And I, I really thought like, if I want to be as good as I can be, like I got to play against the best players. And He's the faster I get to playing against the best players, like the better I'm going to be at the end of my career. So like, I just felt like if this is an option, I feel like I can't pass it up. You were betting on and yourself. an extra training camp for free feels a lot worse than an extra training camp for a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. Training camp's no fun uh, either way, but I would agree with you. Now you were friends with a lot of guys in the class above you. And obviously they were all graduating that year. Did that play a factor in your decision at all? Um, I'd say, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I feel like I, most of my roommates were like going to be done too. And, uh, it, the D line room was going to change. I mean, I think, yeah, all four of us left that year. It was me, Parker, Matt, Sam. Yeah. Me, Parker, Matt, and Sam. And, uh, and yeah, that definitely, I guess, influenced me a little bit, but like at the end of the day, I probably, if I wanted to come back, I would have come back. But I mean, it was just like, I can play in the NFL next year or I can play like for the Hawkeyes again. I was like, I've always dreamed of playing in the NFL, like just to have that opportunity and pass it up. I just couldn't see myself like passing it up. Right. You already had your degree, right? Yeah. And I finished my degree in December before we played the Outback Bowl. Yeah, in 2018 or 19 or whatever that was. And Drake, this might be the smartest day we've had on the podcast because I we had Cole Fisher on earlier, and I know that you're also smart as shit, Antoine. That you, was what that was part of the uh, never feel bad for him that I left out. I actually meant to say smart as Einstein, but I got ahead of myself mm. and I you know I stumbled. But yeah, you're you you finished. I think I read it somewhere maybe you had like a three, eight, four GPA in business and accounting. Yeah. So fuck you basically. <laughs> um, uh, I had a, I had a two, eight, two in exercise science. So, Hey, you know, um, and you degrees didn't degree. have a two, eight, two because you cheated off me and every other person to get that two, eight, two. Oh, that's a legend. And now you run your own fitness business. So who's the asshole? <laughs> I guess, uh, general education I, I don't know the the system is the asshole in this in, in this scenario um but you you deciding part of that sounds like anthony you were just betting on yourself right like you're you, you kind of thought you knew you were going to get an opportunity uh you weren't a fringe guy who was like oh is he going to be able to make a camp like no you were going to make a camp and have the opportunity to if it was there you're going to have the opportunity to, to take advantage of a roster spot. And you just felt comfortable knowing, like, I think I bet on myself more than the guys I'm going to go against. And I'm going to take that chance. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. Just my, I mean, I knew I was going to get a chance in camp. I, I knew I was going to get drafted. Um, and, you know, just where was really the only question, but uh, yeah, I mean, I just knew that once I got into camp, like I'd be able to figure it out and, uh, um, yeah, but I did. I mean, I got hurt a couple times my rookie year, which which sucks. But um, you know, that's that was also. I mean, it was nice that I left and didn't get hurt at Iowa. So yeah. Um, did you? One of the questions we had was, did you ever question that decision once you had made it? Do you ever think back of what a, a final season could have been at Iowa? No, uh, no. I now that you're a Super Bowl that. champion, I guess it's like, why yeah. the fuck would you? But <laughs> no, I mean. I was like, dang, I kind of missed being in Iowa City, you know, and I still obviously have a bunch of people in my class that were there. And Well, now and, you uh, have Ebor City. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is basically second home to Hawk, uh, Hawk fans uh, yeah. every December or January. <laughs> but, uh, no, it was I, – I missed it. Like, I missed Iowa City because I was like, you know, I've been there for four years. I really liked all the people there. But I never really, like – I never regretted or, or really thought twice about, like, the football part of that. Good. You shouldn't. Uh, plus you're getting paid, which is fucking awesome. It's so good. Like, so I'm really happy for you. We really are. Um, <laughs> so you, you get drafted and you end up in Tampa Bay, right? And we're going to get to Tom, Tampa Bay in the, in the Super Bowl this year, but last year's a different Gronka Bay. Gronka Bay. I want to know what it's like being teammates with Gronk, dude. <clears throat> 
Well, we we can ask that now. What was it? What, what is it like? What what are to, what is that like being on an NFL roster with the goat, the goat of goats? Some would say, and maybe the maybe the one of the coolest dudes ever in Gronk. Yeah, I I mean, just like you guys, just I mean, just exactly how you said it. I mean, Tom is just like he's the goat. He's undeniably the goat, especially after this year. But like, I mean, it's incredible. Like I. You know, we grew up watching him win Super Bowls, and now he's like in the locker room every day. And you know, you walk by him, and and it, like every day, just like going to your locker, and it's like, you know, holy shit, is that that's Tom Brady? <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible, right? It's yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Like it takes a while to get used to, and and uh, but it was awesome. I mean, it was really really awesome playing with him. He brings a lot of confidence with him when he steps into our locker room, just based off his legacy. He doesn't have to say anything or do anything. Um, and I think like just his presence in our locker room really helped us this year, like with confidence. Um, and then Gronk is as advertised, he's literally like one of the coolest dudes ever. And like, he's just like always a good time, always smiling, like literally never has a bad day, always brightening people's days around him. Um, just a goofy guy that like likes to have fun. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's unreal. Like, you know, you're, I, those guys are like celebrities still to me and, and, uh, to be able to play against them and go against them was, was pretty fun. Their their life works a little different than yours does. Uh, even even though you're on the same team, like Tom. So everybody, you know, half the questions we took on Twitter was like, "What is Tom Brady like?" And obviously, he's a special guy. How much of the cult, like, what was the culture like last year in the locker room, and how does Tom and Gronk stepping into the picture affect that? Was it was it visibly a, a thing where if Tom's in the room, people just they do things differently? Um, yeah, I think I don't know if it's necessary. Like, I feel like our culture wasn't that much different. I just feel like like because everybody was we had a good culture last year. Um, we we're just so inconsistent with our play. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes like this year, when you have Tom on the sideline. And I think is like in practice, I think the culture was very much the same. I, I think both him and then in Jameis last year, like it was, there was an expectation of like working hard and, and getting right in practice and doing all these things. I think it just really comes in the game. It's like with, with him on the sideline, the defense feels like they can just play more free and everybody just kind of thinks like it's going to work out. Like he's going to find a way to win the game. Like we're just going to end up winning. Like that's just kind of like the mentality that was different than last year. That's crazy. You just kind of like, you're like, you, you see up Tom Brady on the side and you just kind of assume you're going to find like at the end of the game, you're going to win somehow. He just had, he just puts that confidence to everybody that there is. And actually you want to know what that sounds like on a, it's a much different level, but in 20, in 2015, that's kind of what having CJ felt like a little bit, right guys? Like, wouldn't you say? CJ gave you that kind of thing that was like, we're going to figure this out. Like we're going to find a way to, to get it done. CJ was that guy. CJ was literally, he made his, he made his legacy at Iowa on being that guy that just got the job done. Like you just, whenever it was time to get the job done, CJ got the job done. It's incredible. It's, it's so amazing to have that guy in the locker room. It's, it's just a different kind of thing. Um, you made the switch. We, we, we joked a little bit about it. From D line, your straight edge rusher at Iowa, to now you're this hybrid. I'm not even sure how you would describe yourself, but you're an outside linebacker essentially in the in Tampa scheme. And what has that transition been like and the learning curve of that? That's got to be a little bit weird, right? Yeah. Um, that was probably the most challenges I faced when I got to Tampa was moving from like a 4-3 DN to a 3-4 outside linebacker. Um, you know, a lot of times in the NFL, people are in nickel packages and we and we slide to a four-man front. So I end up playing the same like defensive end position. Right. But with the, a lot of our base stuff, we, I mean, there's just like a lot more dropping and coverage principles. And I basically had zero idea how to, how to drop into any coverage. That had to be so, daunting. Yeah, it wasn't fun, like, trying to learn how coverage against NFL guys. <laughs> no. But, um, <laughs> I mean, I was, you know, I'm used to hand on the ground, running forward every play to, you know, dropping and, and doing different zone concepts and, and, and stuff like that. So, 
it, it's moving I'm back still, I'm definitely, huh? yeah, I'm definitely still learning. Like even to this day, I feel like I'm still picking up his own concepts, but um, it was uh, interesting to start off. And part of that learning curve is you are behind two dudes who are pretty good. Uh, Shaq, <laughs> Shaq Barrett and JPP talk about playing with them. Yeah, it's been, uh, I mean, it's been pretty crazy. The thing that was cool, um, cause JPP, I mean, JPP has been a star for, for so long years, but hey, Shaq is, Shaq's is a new star. What'd you say, Kev? Is it weird shaking his hand? Wow. yeah it is it is it gets everybody the first time and and uh and everybody like everybody likes to laugh about it I bet. but uh yeah i mean how it, sick JPP's is it that JPP, how sick is it that jpp's never lost a playoff game really it's incredible it's incredible yeah. i mean that's a, yeah that's insane um uh, I guess give us some good content in these questions, Kluber. Technically, Antoine hasn't lost a playoff game either. <laughs> um, True. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me pull up some of these other questions. Um, oh, what wait. Hold like, on. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. I was going to say compare your favorite win at Iowa and how many times greater was it to win a Super Bowl? <laughs> it's a great question. I mean, so my favorite win at Iowa was probably between a couple, and you guys were there. I think this was was it, this was your last game. The 2017 bowl game was one of my favorites. Really, the pinstripe bowl. Pinstripe bowl. Yeah, just because like we, they hadn't won, we hadn't won in forever. Sure. And then to kind of like break through that one, but then like probably I heard you know, it was then, great. Like, Ohio State or Michigan. Yeah. Um, Kevin had a concussion but, during the pinstripe, so he doesn't remember much. Oh, I forgot about that. Sorry, Kev. <laughs> okay. Keep going. Sorry. But the uh, uh, the winning Super Bowl was – winning the NFC Championship was, like, probably, like, ten times better than any of those games. And the Super Bowl was, like, a hundred times. <laughs> and that's, Just with, like... <laughs> that's with hardly any fans, dude. That's with 30,000 people in the stands, and the Super Bowl is 100 times better. Like, if you would have asked me before this year, like – how much better could it be winning Super Bowl or winning the NFC Championship? I would not have said like a hundred times better. Bro, like, how was the parade on the yachts? We now got a chance to talk about the yacht parade. I mean, that was that was by far like winning the game in itself was like the coolest part. But then like that was the the coolest thing we got to do. Like that was insanity. Like there's just like thousands of people um, on like on the side, like hundreds of boats, like rolling with us in on uh, on the boats we got and then like i mean it was crazy i mean it was we just like for three hours we just rolled down the river down downtown tampa and um i mean it was it was amazing to see how many people there were out there and they're actually like they started like throwing beer cans and like trying to like get us to like drink them but like they were like projectiles like people would get hit like you had to like watch out and dodge them so i mean it was just like crazy experience and it, it was so much fun Oh, I know Tom had dead in these million dollar boats with beer cans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you just hear like thuds and just like beer cans just exploding. And like a couple, like one of our media people like got hit in the leg and just like huge, like well bruised, like in this, oh, like a circle can bruise, <laughs> like literally like 20 seconds it. after she got a hit. And I was just, I felt so bad, but like everybody had their head on a swivel. And it was, I mean, it was the craziest time. That's unbelievable. Did you uh, see the trophy toss in person? Uh, I did, but I was a, I was a couple boats back. Someone asked on the questions if you would have made a better throw boat to boat with the trophy. Absolutely not. Tom Brady's a goat. Can't throw better than him. <laughs> what do you have to say to the Karen that said it was an absolute disgrace and she can hardly sleep at night because Tom Brady, the greatest athlete to ever grace this planet, tossed one of her replica trophies that – Gronk actually dented a couple of years prior and threw it safely. Please explain uh, your thought process on that, please. I mean, my thought process is it's, it's more of a celebration of the trophy by throwing it. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, everybody's got their own opinion. So there's all those people out there. One thing Very we diplomatic have... answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like Anthony could probably be in politics. He's, he's very cleaned up and tidy like that. 
one thing we haven't mentioned is our boy T Daddy Werfs. Uh, what has it been like having him in Tampa now? And the insane year that he just had as a rookie blocking for the goat. Um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, he's a beast. You guys know it. I mean, he's he's so good. He was so good at Iowa. And, like, I I remember, like, Ike, Ike uh, graduated. And then I'm thinking, like, all right, like. I'll I'm going to get a break. Like, yeah, I'm going to get a nice break. Like, you know, a young guy will come in and, and I'll just have a little advantage on him. And that advantage lasted, like, a month with worse. He's so good. But, yeah, he – I mean, he did so good this year. And it was, it was really special, like, because we went against each other all spring ball, fall camp, like, blocks one-on-one, nine and seven. Like, we lined up against each other every day. Damn. And then, you know, to be able to play against each other and or play with each other now and then when, when a Super Bowl was – I mean, it was, it was pretty special. And he's still a beast. Did, so. he, did he get robbed on Rookie of the Year? Can we make that claim? Or are we going to start that train? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'm fully behind Tristan Worth got robbed Rookie of the Year. I love that. Love that. Um, <clears throat> that's insane, dude. We are uh, – watching from afar, the three of us who clearly – don't have a lot better going on than you. Uh, it's been really, really cool to, to watch that shit happen. Um, what are some personal goals? I mean, you just won a Super Bowl in year two. Where does where do you go from here? What does the next three, five, ten years look like for Anthony Nelson? Just uh, yeah, well, first off, just try and get another one. I mean, as long as Tom's here and, and we got um, a lot of these guys, we should have a good shot. But I mean, Hey, Antoine, which Super Bowl is the best one? Next one, baby. Yes, sir, baby. He's <laughs> part of the TV 12 mindset. It's over with. Antoine's going to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, but just keep hanging around. Keep tricking people into thinking I'm good at football and keeping me around here. And, uh, and then uh, just try and win another Super Bowl. I just know that, like, we got – I mean, there's a lot of things. It's, like – you got to have a really good team to win the Super Bowl, but like, there's got to be like balls bouncing in your way too. And yeah. uh, so it's going to be tough to do, but I mean, getting one, it was like, it was awesome. It was an amazing experience, like so much fun, but like, it just feel like that much better than to do it again. You just kind of like, you get it once you want to do it again. Someone asked uh, in his prime, how do you think he, how does he think he would do against Garza? <laughs> I mean, I uh, I'd have to. He's I'd about to, to say Garza. that he would shut Garza. I was gonna down. say he his pride. Want to say it. His pride right now is it. telling him he could defend, but <laughs> my pride in his is mind saying, right like, now is going. Luca can't stop me, and Luca can't back me down. <laughs> yeah, my pride is absolutely one hundred percent saying Luca could not stop me. I'd take him into deep waters, pull him out outside the block, and and give him something. But <laughs> but. I think defensively, it'd be, it'd be a little tougher. He's he's just he's got the height on me, and he's just so good in there, a little crafty. But but I think offensively, I could, I could pull him out, pull him out to the three point line, and take him in deep waters. That's funny, um, Kev. I think your mic is a little. You might want to fix it quick. Um, anything else before we before we leave? I mean, this is he's he's the champ. He's the he's the people's champ. He's the world champ. He's one of two Super Bowl champions now that we've had on the show, uh, along with Ben Neiman, who you played against. Um, did you? Who talk I to him just played golf with, and I yeah. want you guys to know that Ben is a little bit sore still. I don't know when the Super Bowl was two weeks ago or something. My guy has some wounds that still aren't healed. How can you sit to Ben in the game there, Antoine? Sorry, what'd you say? You talking any shit to Ben in the game there? Oh yeah, uh, well a little bit, you know, a couple big head jokes when he's running by me on special teams, but but <laughs> nothing nothing too bad. Um, you know, I mean, you you kind of focused up, but you still get a couple jabs in there, and uh, he uh, he's not much of a, a trash talker, so I don't think he really said anything anything back to me. But yeah, he's boring as shit, man. Like <laughs> the guy just die. He needs a he needs to get a little flair in his life, but he, you know he got his last year, and so it wasn't his time. He he had his time. Sure. What was it like to go and try and sack Patty Mahomes? Yeah, that was, that was just a nice little chore, but uh, there, uh, I mean, we got back there a lot, but he's, 
I mean, he's, I don't know how he's so athletic and like elusive. Like he just kind of like always knows where the guy's going and where the guy's leaning and just kind of leans the other way. And I mean, even when he's getting thrown, or like when he's getting tackled, he's like throwing it sideways and stuff. It was, I mean, it's, it's awesome to go against a guy like that. Cause you're like, I mean, you're chasing one, like you're chasing one of the best quarterbacks, probably the best quarterback in the league right now. And one of the best, like probably will be one of the best when it's all said and done. So, I mean, I mean, it's pretty great. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty cool. And then, but it was definitely not easy. One last question from Twitter and then Drake and Kevin can hit you with whatever they got. If there's anything, um, one of the questions was, why do you think your the D line and you guys were able to get so much success against them in the Super Bowl? We, um, we were getting like football schematically. We were able to play a lot of two high safeties um, against them. And that was mainly because we got early lead and uh, we were that able helps. to stop the run. Yeah. Um, with six in the box or, or seven, depending on the formation. But, um, and then, but then in that, once you get the lead and you can really pin your ears back, it's tough to stop uh, pass rushers. Yeah. Especially good ones. Like uh, we got JP and Shaq and all them. And Anthony Nelson. Yeah. <sighs> That's all I got. I mean, it's been a pleasure, man. You guys got anything else? Nope. I was going to say it's been an absolute pleasure and we appreciate you bringing your champion ass on the podcast. Yeah. Appreciate you guys having me on. Good to see y'all. Doesn't matter what you do the rest of your life. You can rob a bank. You can uh, <laughs> run for president. You're always going to be known as a Super Bowl champion first. So congratulations, dude. Uh, yes. I appreciate it. Congrats from the three of us. It's it's better than what we will probably all do combined in our lifetime. So we're happy to be here yeah. and, and just be spectators. Um, man, that was fun. Episode 192 of the Washed Up Walk-Ons. They don't you don't get a Super Bowl champion on every episode. In fact, about one every 100 episodes. So take this in for all you still listening. Um, as always, we hope you enjoyed the episode. 192, 200, quickly closing in. It'll be a special one. That's it. We'll talk at you again. Peace.